For today's story, we have an instance where a person who was accused of sexual assault on a college campus has sued the person who made the claim and has been awarded damages. So we're going to read this case and see how it goes and go to show that it's not okay to make false claims of sexual assault. So let's read the case and see what happens. Plaintiff Alex Goldman filed this action pursuant to the court's diversity jurisdiction, alleging defamation and tortious interference with prospective economic advantage and business relationships by dependent Catherine Reddington. The complaint focuses on statements Reddington made via text messages and social media claiming, among other things, that Goldman had raped her when they were university students. Goldman seeks damages and injunctive relief in joining Reddington from propagating the alleged falsities. Before the court is Reddington's motion to dismiss, pursuant to federal rules, for reasons explained below, Reddington's motion is denied in part and granted in part. In 2017, Reddington and Goldman were both students at Syracuse University. Goldman was a civil engineering student on track to graduate with a bachelor's degree in 2018 and a master's in business administration in 2019. Both Goldman and Reddington participated in Greek life on campus. On April 27th, 2017, Goldman's fraternity and Reddington's sorority hosted a joint party at the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity house where Goldman resided. After the party, Reddington spent the night in Goldman's room. Goldman alleges surveillance footage shows him walking to his room at approximately 12.30 in the morning with Reddington following a few feet behind. When Goldman and Reddington awoke on April 23, 2017, it is undisputed that they were fully clothed and neither could remember what transpired after midnight. The next day on April 24, 2017, Reddington visits Krauss Hospital in Syracuse, New York, complaining of a possible sexual assault. She believed she may have been drugged given her lack of memory. A sexual assault nurse examination was conducted, which showed no intoxicant present in her bloodstream other than caffeine and marijuana. She submitted items of clothing, specifically underwear, which had no visible blood, and a white leotard, which had a blood stain in the crotch area. The examination found two tears to the labia, but there were no internal cuts or abrasions, and she had smooth hymen edges. A DNA analysis indicated that her vagina was negative for male DNA. In May of 2017, Reddington reported the sexual assault to the Syracuse Police Department. Following an investigation, Detective Michael Bates of the SPD closed the case, given the absence of the physical evidence and Reddington's statements in an interview that she had no recollection of the night in question after 12.30. Bates forwarded his report to the county district attorney's office, which concluded its own investigation, memorialized in a report by the assistant district attorney. Based on the review of the evidence and the independent investigation, Barry concluded there was no corroborating evidence and no physical evidence from the examination to support allegations of sexual assault. The report also noted that Ms. Reddington has stated repeatedly she had no direct knowledge of any sexual acts that she may have engaged in, and her lack of memory and any witness made it impossible to prove. The report recognized that sexual assaults are inherently difficult to prove, but ultimately concluded there's no credible proof of any sexual conduct in this case, consensual or non-consensual. In approximately June 2017, Reddington filed a complaint with Syracuse, and the school's Title IX investigator conducted an investigation. While Reddington initially told Jacobson she could not recall the night in question, weeks later she reported experiencing sudden flashes of memory following a visit to a therapist. Reddington told Jacob that she had had sexual intercourse with Goldman and was sodomized by him without consent. Jacobson concluded that Goldman had violated the student code of conduct and he was expelled in November 2017. So for those keeping track, she made an initial report to the hospital that she had no memory of the event. She told the police she had no memory of the event. She told the DA she had no memory of the event. And then she told the Title IX coordinator she had no memory of the event. But weeks later, she said, oh, I have memory of the event. And then the school decided to expel him. To my mind, this seems like this may not be the appropriate course of action. You know, we have someone here who says they have no memory of the event. There's no evidence of sex, either consensual or non-consensual. There's no testimony, no evidence of any kind. No one saw anything. And they're expelling the guy based on this. This, to me, seems a bit absurd. Reddington celebrated by visiting the house the day after Goldman was expelled, bragging that her rapist was expelled. Goldman notices that she was seven credits shy of graduating at the time. Just super. Following his expulsion, Goldman moved to New Jersey, enrolled in a new school, 
and obtain an internship for the summer with Bowler Engineering. Goldman alleges Reddington embarked on a campaign of defamation in a systematic process of publicly and falsely branding him a rapist. She texted two of Goldman's friends, calling him a monster and a violent rapist. Goldman attaches to the complaint several social media posts made by Reddington. The complaint identifies six specific statements as defamatory. On November the 17th, 2017, a text message referring to Goldman as a violent rapist. On May the 18th, a text message referring to him as a monster. On June the 4th, 2014, a Facebook post referring to him as a rapist and stating this was not the first time he had, quote, raped someone and I want to make sure it is the last, unquote, included a picture of him, marked the location of his new campus, and tagged him in the photo. June the 14th, 2018, in a LinkedIn post referring to him as a rapist. June the 5th, 2018, on a Facebook post, which included a screenshot of a direct Facebook message to Bowler. Only a portion of the message is displayed, but the post shows Bowler's response, which states that Bowler immediately elected to terminate the employment relationship with Goldman upon learning of the allegation. Redmond posts that she feels happy that Goldman lost his position, calls him a monster, and a disgusting excuse for a man. June the 16th, 2018, Facebook review of the post stating, a school that accepts a recently expelled rapist despite it being marked on their transcript. The Facebook and LinkedIn posts were viewed and liked by thousands of people, and the posts have also been shared. Individuals commented on the post expressing their disdain for Goldman. One user wrote, hopefully I'll catch, they'll catch this animal, I'll share the post in the hope that someone out there who knows him will see it. Another individual commented, this person needs to be off the streets and he will get his, it's only the beginning. Goldman maintains that Reddington's accusations are utterly unfounded and there is equivocally no evidence of sexual assault or rape. Goldman alleges that Reddington's charges of rape were false when made and she knew they were false. He alleges Reddington made these knowingly false statements in order to devastate his educational and career prospects, destroy his personal relationships, destroy his academic relationships with institutions of higher education, destroy his employment opportunities, publicly tarnish his reputation, and wreak havoc on personal life and that of his family. He states that Reddington's objective was to wage a campaign to have him expelled from his new campus and fired from his summer internship. Goldman, in fact, was terminated by his internship. Accordingly, he seeks damages and injunctive relief to remedy the harm that caused by Reddington's campaign of active public harassment. You know, personally, I think that this just goes to show why the campaign idea of hashtag believe all women cannot be taken at face value. I obviously don't know what really occurred here in the real world, but I do know that according to her own testimony, on at least three separate occasions, Given to both government officials and to campus, she has no recollection and there's no physical evidence of any sexual assault occurring of any kind. But she merely claims it happened and because of this mere claim, apparently without any supporting evidence, he was expelled from one campus, fired from another campus, fired from an internship, and he's being targeted for expulsion at yet another campus trying to finish up his own educational opportunities. I think this goes to show the importance of due process and how hashtag me too can go too far and how we do have to have due process process when it comes to campus and Title IX investigation. Reddington moves to dismiss the complaint on the ground that Goldman fails to state a claim of relief. She argues defamation claim must be dismissed because Goldman fails the burden of alleging the statements were false. He does not plead facts to show they were made with gross irresponsibility, what we would call malice to the truth. Certain statements are not actionable because they're either matters of opinion or do not sufficiently identify Goldman. Reddington also claims that she did not Facebook message Bowler and therefore cannot be held responsible for that message. She claims she merely reposted an exchange between Bowler and another individual. Reddington further takes issue with Goldman's request for injunctive relief, arguing it's likely to violate her First Amendment rights. With respect to the tortious interference claim, Reddington argues Goldman fails to allege that she used wrongful means and he does not carry any injury attributable to her conduct. Goldman urges the court to accept his allegations as true for the purpose of evaluating the motion to dismiss. He argues he sufficiently pled facts satisfying the element of both defamation and tortious interference. Considering all factual interferences in favor, the court largely agrees. For reasons set forth below, Reddington's motion to dismiss is denied in part and granted in part. Defamation, consisting of the twin torts of libel and slander, is invasion of interest in reputation and good name. Defamatory words expressed in writing are classified as libel, and this generally includes social media and text messages. To state a claim for libel under New York law, a complaint must allege a false statement that was published to a third party without privilege or authorization and that causes harm, unless the statement is defamation per se, in which case the harm is presumed. This is pretty much the standard for libel in every state, more or less. 
Statements that falsely charge a plaintiff with a serious criminal activity are defamation per se. A crime is serious if it is punishable by imprisonment in a state or federal institution or regarded by the public opinion as involving a moral turpitude, which I would suspect that rape would qualify under this standard. With respect to the first element, plaintiff has the burden of alleging a defamatory statement is false or at least not substantially true. While minor inaccuracies do not give rise to defamation, a statement is substantially true and thus not actionable if it would have the same effect on the mind of the reader as the pleaded truth. In other words, if what I'm saying and the truth would cause the same impression, it's not defamation. If what I say and your corrected version of it would cause the same conclusions in the mind of a listener, then no harm, no foul. In other words, when the truth is so near to the facts as published that fine and shade distinctions must be drawn to sustain the charge of libel, no legal harm must be done. To sustain a motion to dismiss, plaintiffs do, much, do, do more than perfunctory state a statement is false. They must identify how it was false and plead facts that, if proven, would allow a reasonable person to conclude and consider the statement to be false. Under New York law, statements that express opinion and hyperbole, hyperbole rather than facts do not constitute actual defamation. However, an exception to the general rule exists for max mixed opinions, fact definition. In Suffolk case, an opinion that implies is based on facts which would justify the opinion but are unknown to the reader or those hearing it. So this was the exact same thing that came up in the H3F, H3 defamation suit when they're talking about opinion based on private facts. If you're stating an opinion, but you imply that it's based on private facts, that's a mixed statement of opinion and therefore the factual elements of it come in. Presumably, the statement of other rapes would qualify because you are making, if that can be viewed as an opinion, it would be viewed as an opinion based on hidden facts. You are alleging facts and therefore it would be eligible for a defamation claim. New York considers the following non-exclusive list of factors in determining whether a statement is one of fact or opinion. Whether the specific language at issue has a precise meaning which is readily understood, whether the statements are being capable of being true or proven true or false, and whether in either the full context of the communication which the statement appears or a broader social context and surrounding circumstances are such to signal to readers or listeners that what is being read or heard is likely to be an opinion, not fact. Context is central to this analysis, and the ultimate question is whether a reasonable reader could have concluded the statements were conveying facts about the plaintiff. Additionally, the complaint must allege defamatory statement was of and concerning the plaintiff. In other words, the plaintiff must show the statement refers to him such that those who know him would recognize that he was the target. It was referring to him. It's not necessary that the world should understand the libel. It's sufficient if those who know the plaintiff can make out what the person meant. So we're looking to the relevant context. While the of and concerning requirement is generally an issue of fact for a jury to decide, the, per the court may properly dismiss an action where a liable statement is incapable of supporting a jury's finding that refers to the plaintiff. Finally, the plaintiff in a liable case must establish the defendant published the statement culpably. The, requ the requisite level of false varies depending on the status of parties in the context of the statement. Where the plaintiff is a private individual, which is presumably the case here, but the content of the statement is arguably within the sphere of legitimate public concern, potentially true here, the defendant will not be liable unless she acted in a grossly irresponsible manner without due concern for the standards of information gathering and dissemination orally filed by a reasonable party, which I would say is arguably true here. If a plaintiff is a private individual and a statement does not concern the public, the grossly irresponsible standard does not apply and mere negligence will suffice. Here, Reddington published numerous statements viewed by hundreds or thousands of people accusing Goldman of rape. Rape is a sufficiently serious crime to support a claim for defamation per se as one would imagine. Goldman claims Reddington did in fact knowingly lie about the events, then she could be held liable for the reasons explained below. While it's not yet clear whether Goldman will prevail on the merits, construing all the facts in his favor, as the court must at this juncture, the complaint arguably alleges defamation per se. So we're here on a motion to dismiss standard. And under the motion to dismiss standard, we assume all the facts are the most favorable to the other side. So she's saying you should throw it out even based on his facts. So we say, if the facts are as he say, says them, does he have a case? And the court is saying, yes. Now we have to go back to court to perhaps prove some of these things, but he has enough to go forward. That's what the court's talking about. First, Reddington argues the complaint fails to adequately allege that her statements were false. While plaintiffs must offer more than a conclusory statement of falsity, Reddington appends, pay, attempts to impose a heightened standard contrary to New York law. Goldman unambiguously disavows the accusation of rape as utterly unfounded and presents specific facts throughout the report to plausibly allege that the Reddington's claims are not true. 
Thus, the case is distinguishable from other cases that have warranted dismissal. Bryanton cautions the courts against using the report, noting that the district attorney's decision not to bring criminal charges does not conclusively establish that no sexual assault occurred. However, the criminal standard of proof is immaterial here. The court does not read the report as conclusively establishing anything. Rather, the court reads the findings as the alleged facts incorporated into the complaint. In particular, Goldman arises, relies on Barry's determination there is no credible proof of any sexual conduct in this case, consensual or non-consensual. He also points to the absence of any DNA evidence and the fact Reddington initially did not recall the incident. Goldman has pled facts that, if proven, would allow a reasonable person to consider Reddington's accusations to be false. While the court is sensitive to the exceedingly difficult task of corroborating claims of sexual assault and has questions about the examination and Title IX exa investigation, a motion to dismiss is the inappropriate forum to deal with these concerns. Reddington is free to renew her arguments regarding falsity in a motion for summary judgment following discovery. So basically saying after there's some more discovery and there's things here, you can make another motion for a judgment before verdict if that's appropriate, but there's enough to go through discovery here. Reddington also asked this court to find that her statements were substantially true because they are merely fine distinctions between her statements and the truth that Goldman acknowledges. This theory falls flat. Her statements is that Goldman raped her on the one hand and his contention that the accusation is a deliberate lie on the other are worlds apart. Yeah, I'm having a tough time seeing how those are, you know, mere, mere technicalities. They seem pretty widely spread to me. The narratives of what transpired would not have the same effect on, uh, on any reader. On a motion to dismiss without the benefit of discovery and concerning the court's duty to read the allegation in the complaint as true, the court cannot assess, find that Reddington's statements were substantially true. That is, it cannot find that Goldman raped Reddington especially where the report arrived at the con contrary conclusion. Instead, the court finds the facts alleged in the complaint and its attachments allow Goldman to satisfy the liable pleading standard and plausibly allege that Reddington published false statements. Reddington next argues that the defamation count should be dismissed because the text message she sent to Goldman's friend in May 2008 referring to him as a monster is an opinion and therefore constitutes protected speech. While hyperbole is typically not actionable, the court finds that this statement survives as an actual mixed opinion because it implies that it is based on facts, not disclosed to the reader, which it supports the opinion. Why isn't he suing Syracuse? For all I know, he is suing Syracuse in another action. But, you know... Whether or not Syracuse violated his rights under Title IX and whether or not she's guilty of defamation are, of course, two separate things. So I, I don't know that, that Syracuse defam defamed him, but to my mind, he has a cause of action uh, to Syracuse too. In a prior case, the court found that a reasonable reader could discount the erratic and emotional tone of text messages containing the hyperbole and nevertheless view them as expressing underlying statements of fact. Even if a reader could also reach the opposite conclusion at this stage, the court is tasked with assessing whether any reading of the complaint supports the defamation connotation. Here, given the broader social context and surrounding circumstances, the recipient of the text could infer Reddington called Go Go Goldman a monster to convey a fact, namely that he raped her. The fact the text predicated her larger social media campaign is of no consequence, as Reddington was allegedly vocal about her accusations offline too, and this text message was sent after she bragged about Goldman's expulsion at the DKE house. You know, I just uh, by way of personal musing, I don't quite understand why this woman has gone around saying that this guy raped her. I mean, she woke up with no memory of the night before, presumably because she there she was stoned or high or whatever by the time she went to the hospital there was no trace of anything except caffeine and marijuana but she she didn't have any particular memory but I, he didn't either so there's a whole bunch of reasons that might be true but why she's so convinced this guy raped her especially when they walked out with her clothes on the next morning it's like i don't quite understand why she's so convinced in her own mind i it's just I don't quite understand what she's thinking, other other than maybe she saw one too many posters saying, yes, it can happen to you too, and she was utterly convinced by all the, the garbage out there that says that this happens all the time, which it doesn't, that she was utterly convinced that it must have happened to her, even though there's no evidence to the contrary. So I, it's just it's a little mind-blowing to me that it's gone this far. The court declines to bar Goldman from pursuing his claim with respect to the text because it may plausibly be read as an actual mixed opinion. Reddington further argues that her June 6, 2018 Facebook view, view of the NGIT is not actionable because it was not of and concerning Goldman. The post stated, quote, a school that accepts recently expelled rapists despite it being marked on their transcript, unquote. 
Yes, that could mean anyone, right? It could mean absolutely anyone. We didn't mean we didn't mean this guy, right? Come on. Reddington argues that there was no surrounding context, yet the review filed other social media posts made two days earlier in which she called Goldman a rapist, tagged the school, added a picture of Goldman, and linked to his social media pages. Yeah, I think in broader context, you might be able to link those two things together, I would think. Because the school was tagged, it received a notification of her post, and therefore, when she saw the review two days later, it's presumed that they would have known it referred to Goldman. While the review does not identify Goldman by name, it's plausible that those who knew him at the time would have known about the rape accusation and recognized that he was the subject of it. The court concludes, drawing all reasonable inferences in his favor, a reasonable jury could conclude the review on the Facebook page was of and concerning Goldman. Yes, I would think so. The parties dispute where the statements at issue are arguably within the sphere of legitimate public concern and thus whether the grossly irresponsible standard applies. However, the court need not reach this issue because even if gross irresponsible is the requisite level of faults, Goldman satisfies that standard. Yes, he does. The complaint repeatedly alleges that Rangtin knowingly and intentionally made the false statements. On a motion to dismiss, the court accepts this assertion as true, considering the additional facts placed pleaded by Goldman, such as the insufficiency of evidence to corroborate the sexual assault and Reddington's lack of memory, as she stated both to the police and to the DA and to the Title IX officer, at least initially. Did the attorney think any of these things were going to work? It's not like it's New Mexico Supreme Court. I don't know, man. I, I am still back with, like, why does she believe it so much? I just, I don't. I don't know what's going through her mind. Why does she believe it so much that she was sexually assaulted? I don't get it. Anyways. It's not even clear they had sex. That's the other thing that sort of just confuses me in general. Intentional lies not only satisfy, but surpass the culpability of grossly irresponsible, which signifies something more than negligence. Yes, if it's intentional, that would way satisfy something more than negligence, for sure. Accordingly, the complaint sufficiently alleges that Reddington acted with the requisite level of fault, and it cannot be dismissed on that basis. Reddington also asserts that she cannot be held liable for the Facebook message to Bowler because she did not send the message. Goldman alleges that she did send the message, and regardless, she appears to take ownership of it by posting a screenshot of the message and adding her own commentary in celebration, saying she felt happy that he was fired. Whether or not Reddington contacted Bowler directly or only reposted the exchange is widely recognized that one who republishes a libel is subject to liability just as if he republished it, published it originally. Yeah, if you republish it, especially with your own commentary, you're on the hook for that. Even if Reddington merely reposted the message, which a reader could infer repeated alleged false applications of rape, included a caption calling Goldman a monster, a reasonable jury could find the Facebook post is defamatory. Because those who repeat another's defamatory statement are not sheltered from liability, Reddington's argument fails and her alleged lack of involvement in composing the message is not a reason to dismiss the claim. Accordingly, Goldman may pursue his defamation claim with respect to the republication. Reddington also seeks dismissal of Goldman's request for injunctive relief, arguing an injunction may violate her constitutional rights under the First Amendment. However, a plaintiff's request for improper relief is an inappropriate basis for dismissal. The court declines to entertain Reddington's argument on remedies at this time because a motion for failure to state a claim properly addresses the cause of the action, not the remedy sought. Yeah, fair enough. Whether or not she, he can get that remedy goes to remedies, not to the underlying action itself. As Reddington fails to articulate any theory that she might preclude Goldman from having his day in court, she fails to defeat the allegations of defamation in the complaint. To survive a motion to dismiss for tortious interference with prospective economic advantage or business relationship, a plaintiff must allege that he was actually and wrongfully prevented from entering into or continuing a specific business relationship. So here I would give notes to the people who are following the Vic Magnoni story. When we're talking about tortious interference with economic advantage, you have to refer to the continuing specific business relationship. Which business relationships in particular are you talking about? And that was a problem in the Vic Magnoni case where the guy who was representing Vic did not seem to know or could not list what specific contracts he was referring to. So when the court entered the motion to dismiss, on, the, uh, on this theory, the court, at least as far as I could see, was right because they did not say the specific business relationships. This is the New York standard, and it's pretty much generally the standard in every state, more or less. So I don't know exactly how Texas phrases it, but this is basically the right standard everywhere. In New York, a plaintiff must establish a business relationship with a third party. The defendant's interference with those business relationships. The defendant acted with the sole purpose of harming the plaintiff or using a dishonest, unfair, or improper means. An injury to the relationship. The third... 
The third element of wrongful means is satisfied where the defendant's conduct amounts to an independent tort. Goldman has adequately pled all the elements of tortious interference with prospective economic advantage or a business relationship. Rankin has specifically targeted Goldman's relationship with Syracuse and Bowler, allegedly making knowingly false statements designed to interfere with his standing. Her direct communications with these institutions evinced a calculated purpose to convince these third parties to cease their business relationships with him. Although Reddington argues her statements were driven by a desire to prevent further sexual assaults, which, you know, presumes that there was a prior sexual assault, which there's no evidence for, Goldman satisfies the requirement of wrongful means by plausibly alleging that she commented, committed the independent tort of defamation. Reddington also argues that Goldman has not suffered any injury attributable to her conduct, really, but he was expelled from his university and fired from his internship. If Reddington reported false accusations and Goldman was subsequently expelled and fired, those amount to cognizable injuries. Moreover, contrary to Reddington's theory, the fact that Syracuse conducted its own investigation does not eviscerate the complaint. If the investigation was premised based on the lies she propagated, then her interference would still be the primary cause and the but-for cause of the expulsion, right? The fact that you lied was the only reason that this all happened. It's your problem. Steer, still, Goldman has failed to allege any injury relating to his standing at NGIT. Reddington raised this issue in her motion, and Goldman failed to respond, essentially conceding the point by not contesting it. In an affidavit submitted in connection with his order to show cause, Goldman stated, Now I'm nervous about my situation at the university, as they're evaluating my standing at the university. However, the affidavit is not properly considered on this motion, as a court must limit its review to allegations raised or otherwise incorporated into the pleading. Moreover, the vague statement that Goldman is nervous does not allege any concrete harm and thus fails to meet the threshold requirement of the pleading injury. According to why Goldman is not foreclosed from pursuing his claim with respect to Syracuse and Bowler, his claim that Rankin interfered with his relationship and JIT is dismissed without prejudice. And I do like the fact that it's without prejudice because the court is kind of noting here that if the situation should change because the school should expel him, for example, he could bring his claim anew. So nice touch from the court by dismissing that particular element without prejudice, basically saying if more facts happen, you can bring this again. So good for him. For the foregoing reasons, Reddington's motion to dismiss is denied in its entirety, except with respect to the tortious interference concerning the new university, which is dismissed without prejudice. And this case is rec recommended to Magistrate Judge Lindsay for supervision for all pretrial matters. So that is the case of Alex Goldman versus Catherine Reddington. You know, I don't know what happened and neither does anyone else, including, might I add, the parties at issue, since both of them say that they have no memory of the night after midnight. So ne no one apparently knows the truth of what actually happened that evening. So it's a little bit amazing it's got this far, but I think above all things, it shows the importance of due process. It shows that people can and apparently do make false rape accusations. I know there are people out there who seem to think that this is a thing that could never, ever happen, but it does happen as we've just read this case. And, you know, there should be some due process to ensure that people are not being railroaded on a complaint, particularly when all the evidence goes the other way to suggest that there was no assault at all. So I don't know why Syracuse expelled this guy, except perhaps because they're wrapped up in Me Too and hashtag Believe All Women. But it goes to show that all complaints should be judged based on their own merits. You know, I think that people should be taken seriously, but at the same time, people should be given due process. And if there's not enough there, there's not enough there. So, you know, you go forth, Alex Goldman, and I hope things go well for you because it sounds like you're getting railroaded and for reasons that baffle my understanding because I do not understand why Catherine Reddington is pursuing this case so hard when by her own admission, she has no memory of anything occurred and the physical evidence suggests nothing occurred. So I don't know why she's so convinced she was raped. It seems a little baffling to me, but... We are where we are.